Tonight, we introduce this semester's fellows to you. And we are much looking forward to what they have to say to us. However, before it is the turn of the fellows, Professor Hermann Patzinger will tell them about an important development in Berlin. In my life as a university dean, provost, president, I have gathered rich experience in introducing speakers. I must confess that that experience does not stand me in good stead tonight, because Professor Patzinger has so many accomplishments as an archaeological scholar, a, finder, a founder, an administrator, a public intellectual, that I would be justified to, if I threw up my arms in despair. I need to be highly selective, and I will be highly selective. One of his books, of whose 848 pages, I am the fortunate owner, this is the fourth edition, 2015, has the title, Die Kinder des Prometheus, The Children of Prometheus. It covers five million years of human history before the invention of script and deals with many prior human inventions such as agriculture, tools, and clothing. As an archaeologist, Professor Patzinger was first recognized for his work on the Scythians, Eurasian nomads who engaged in mounted warfare. In 2001, he discovered, I mentioned he was a finder, in 2001, he discovered a Scythian princely tomb in Tuva that contained 6,000 golden objects. Uh, I'm, I have never seen them. You ex exhibited them here, I think, uh, a few years ago. Uh, where can I go and, and, and see them? Is there a place? In the Hermitage Center. Ah, yeah. OK. Okay, I didn't even know there was such a state as Tuva before I read <laughs> about your discoveries. Professor Patzinger continues to this date to be an active archaeologist in spite of the fact that in 2008 he became one of the most influential, not to say powerful persons in Berlin when he was named president of the Foundation for Prussian Cultural Assets the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz. He is, as it were, the true heir to Prussia, not to say the Prussian throne. I need to provide uh, just a bit of historical context. When the Allied Control Council, after World War II, was the government of Germany, it passed in 1947 Allied Control Council Law Number 46. Its preamble stated, the Prussian state, which from early days has been a bearer of militarism and reaction in Germany, has de facto ceased to exist. Now, needless to say that the characterization in the Control Council Law Number 46 is not shared by all historians. But what is so interesting about this statement that uh, Prussia de facto ceased to exist is that to be on the safe side, apparently not fully trusting the de facto end of Prussian existence, the Allied Control Council went on to provide in Article 1 of Law Number 46, the Prussian state together with its central government and all its agencies are abolished. So after it has already ceased to exist, it is now being abolished. <laughs> that is being on the safe side indeed. And uh, Article 3 arranged for the transfer of Prussian assets and liabilities to the successor states or in German, the lender. Only 10 years later, a statute of the newly created Federal Republic of Germany established the Stiftung Preußischer Kulturbesitz, the foundation for Prussian cultural assets. It is a kind of Smithsonian institution writ, la writ large that has become even more important after German reunification. 
It now owns every important museum in Berlin, the Berlin State Library, the Prussian, Prussian Secret State Archives, etc., etc. Mrs. Lindemann, where are you? There. She, uh, just told us that she spends every day in, this, uh, uh, in the Prussian archives. Now, Mr. Patzinger is the ruler over all these riches, worth much more than the 6,000 gold objects he found in Tuva. And I have asked him tonight to speak tonight about his most recent challenge. The palace of the Prussian kings in Berlin was destroyed during World War II. In its place, the German Democratic Republic built the Palace of the Republic as the seat of its parliament, so-called. After reunification, the Palace of the Republic was torn down in its turn, and the decision was made to resurrect the royal palace. This had led to a project called Humboldt Forum, about which I have invited Professor Patzinger to tell us. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. President, lieber Gerhard Kasper, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor for me at this occasion to talk to you. Um, of course, the introduction took already a part of my lecture. <laughs> I mean, it's because I'm used to that always to start explaining what is the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Fact is that one always has to explain this also to a purely German audience. And it's true. I mean, it's perhaps the last relict of Prussia its cultural institutions. And many times I'm asked, Prussian cultural heritage, where can we learn something about the Hohenzollern and so on? I say, no, no, sorry. I mean, of course, the, the, the secret state archive has at least 38 kilometers of, arc, of documents and, and uh, sources for Prussian and German history. But the rest, especially the, the National Museums of uh, Berlin, the National Library of Berlin, the Ibero-American Institute, they are collecting world heritage of all kinds. So the Prussian cultural heritage, Prussia founded institutions which then collected what is the cultural heritage of the world, as it was done in London, in, in, in uh, Paris, of course, in Petersburg, and a little bit later also in New York. So it's one of the large universal museums. But independent from that, it's more than this. It's not only the 16 museums, which have extraordinary collections from antiquity to contemporary art. It's the National Library I mentioned already with 12 million volumes. It's the largest universal scientific library, in, not only in Germany, in the whole German-speaking world. And this extraordinary uh, Sonderabteilung and special collections, where, for example, just an example, the largest collection of Persian manuscripts, except Persia itself, so they, they, the Prussians and, uh, I mean, the, the representatives, the specialists of the institutions, they collected from the 18th, especially in the 19th and early 20th century, they collected really like hell. It's unbelievable. Any small collection, any very special collection you want to see, Berlin is under the top three or top five worldwide. So this you can, you can get an idea what it really means, these institutions, and this institution, and of course, as um, Professor Gerhard mentioned, after the Second World War, all these collections have been spread over Germany to be secure in mines and in bunkers, to be secure from, of course, from the war, from the air raids and so on. And uh, then after 1947, I mean, Prussia didn't exist anymore. And for the first president of the foundation, which was, the foundation was founded in 1957. It was a large deal and it took more than 10 years to bring all these collections back to Berlin. At that time, West Berlin, because many of the collections have been collected in Wiesbaden, in Hessen and in other German states. And they said, well, Prussia is the owner, of course, but Prussia is not existing anymore. So we are the owner. So this was a large deal and a difficult story to bring all the collections back. And I think this was, in the, last, in the first 20 years, this was the main task of the foundation. Of course, the German unification was an enormous step forward. It was not just unifying Germany, unifying Berlin. It was also the opportunity to unify the collection because what was left in the East, what was left in the West from museum, 
archive and library collection was just by chance, as you can imagine, what was in the Western occupation zones and was in the Soviet occupation zone. So this was just by chance. And of course, uh, the heart, even the museum island was not the oldest institution, the museums on the museum island of the, of the foundation, because the, the National Library of Berlin and the archive have been much older. The archive, by the way, was founded in the uh, 14th century. But nevertheless, we, we all feel that the museum island is something as the, as the zone of origin of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. And of course, taking it over after 1990, the most important task was to unify the collection, but of, of course to reorganize the whole, the whole of Berlin concerning cultural institutions, because you could not unify the collection and bring them back at their original place, because they grew. Other things are lost, are still in Russia, have been destroyed, whatever. So it needs a whole concept, and therefore I'm considering also myself just one, one piece in the chain of uh, at least two or three generations, and I think the last chain will be after me, because I will not be able to finish everything. It's a long-lasting work, really, to bring everything back. And just to explain you, in the first 20, 25 years, our main task was to restore the buildings from the Prussian period, the Museum Island, the National Library unter den Linden, and this is just half of it we did, because the Museum Island will keep us busy still many years, but now we extended it to the buildings of modernity of West Berlin, Mies van der Rohe's new National Gallery. Soon we will have to start to restore Sharon's uh, National Library, Potsdamer Straße, so this is something else. And then, not only restoring the old ones, the not so old ones, we have to add new ones. And our most recent project is the Museum for 20th Century Art on the Potsdamer Straße near Kultur Forum. The government gave us 20 millions of euro to now, and we even started the competition, the first phase of the competition. And what we really want, and because we do not have the space really to present the art of 20th century, where in Mies van der Rohe there's not enough space, only small segments you can show, really to tell the story of the 20th century through art. I mean, beginning with expressionism, classical modernity, the great rake in the middle of the 20th century, and then what followed after until the end of the 20th century. And the National Gallery, it's a real National Gallery in Berlin, can also tell what happened after 1945 in East and West Germany, because it has collections of both former National Galleries. So there are many things to do, <clears throat> and as if there are not enough, we also have to reconstruct the Berlin Palace. I mean, not we. In this case, there's a foundation uh, which has to do this. I think it's really, except all these other projects, the most outstanding project uh, we have to do. And um, it was always the question, what has to happen in the center, in the very center of Berlin, on the Schlossplatz? And the decision which was taken in 2002 by the German parliament was to demolish the Palace of the Republic and to rebuild the palace, but not one by one, not 100%. I think it's more a quote than a real reconstruction. There are the facades, there's the couverture, the plan, but inside is contemporary architecture. And of course, the contents of it is quite different from what was there before, but not completely. Because, and this I always mention, and we all who are, have something to do with the project mention this, I mean, in the Berlin Palace have been all the collections of the museums which later step by step, beginning with the old museum built by Schinkel in the early 19th century, have been shifted towards the Museum Island. The Museum Island was the Freistätte für Kunst und Wissenschaft, the, the free, the open space for art and science. And it was from the beginning a completely different concept than Louvre, Repetition Museum and others in Hermitage, because it was not one building with many floors and wings and so on. Not, no, it was one building for each, let's say, epoch, or cultural sphere or group of art. So it has been a complex of very different museums, starting with Schinkel and ending up with, uh, for the time being, the Pergamon Museum. And these buildings are also somehow reflecting paradigmatically the history of museology, of mu museological presentation and muse museological architecture from the beginning of 19th to the beginning of 20th century. So this is one thing, but then, I mean, the place of origin of all these collections is in the palace, the so-called Humboldt Forum. We prefer to talk about the Humboldt Forum. There's a large, as you can imagine, uh, 
debate, a very emotional debate for many, many years, if this should be rebuilt or not, if one should demolish the palace of the Republic or not. I mean, there was a decision taken democratically, but I think it was very important to understand the project that when it was taken in 2002, and all parties in German parliament with a great majority voted in favor of the project, it was because it was somehow rebuilding it, partly, as I said, to fill the gap, the urbanistic gap in the historical center of Berlin, but then inside to do something completely different, to present, to use the, non, the so-called non-European collections of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation and really to create here, called Humboldt Forum, a center of dialogue with the world, to present world culture in a completely new way. And I think this combination, some people forget it because sometimes I get letters and they ask me, and why don't you make one floor for Prussian history? No. Then I say, sorry, go opposite as the German Historical Museum. That they can, you can learn about the history of Prussia. But here it was part of the resolution, of the decision of the German parliament to combine both the building and a completely different interior. And of course, what we want inside the Humboldt Forum, the Humboldt Forum, of course, Alexander, no need to explain his relation to, to the non-European world, the, the great discoverer, the second, the scientific Columbus of America, but also it refers to Wilhelm von Humboldt because as a linguist, he was dealing with Southeast uh, uh, Asian and Pacific languages. Some of his projects, the Humboldt University is still continuing. So both brothers for us are important as symbols for cosmopolitan and also for an equivalence of world culture. And of course, these are great words. And you can say, and how do you do that? How want you achieve this? And of course, the, the backbone of the Humboldt Forum are the collections. Now they are still in Dahlem, the Ethnological Museum, the Museum of Asian Art, more than half a million of objects, which really, in an extraordinary way, in an extraordinary richness, represent world culture in Africa, in Asia, in Oceania, in Australia, and in the Americas, and to bring it back to the place where they originated, because the first ethnographical collection was in the palace. And then, of course, it goes not only into the palace, it really will be, as I said, the backbone of it. And there will be uh, the Humboldt University will save some spaces. There will be a, a space which tells the story of Berlin related to the world through the centuries, which is important. I mean, Berlin, the state of Berlin is now developing the concept. It's, I'm, I'm glad about that because it's important because it's somehow, the, it makes a relation to the, to the collections, to the history of the collection. The history of the collection are not floating. They get something, a basement in the history of Prussia and of Germany because the Humboldts, the brother Humboldts are important. But of course, there are other aspects, the Berlin Congo conference in the negative sense, but in, in many other um, events in the history of the 18th, 19th, early 20th century, which have to be presented also because they are part of Berlin. And of course, I mean, about the Humboldt Forum, one could talk much more time than, than I have, but just to explain you how we want to use this, because in the ground floor, there are spaces for cinema, for music, multifunctional halls, etc., etc. And that what will be now the task for the coming years to develop a program and how all this fits together. But again, the backbone are the collections. And I think and what I want to tell you, just ending up in a few examples, is how, or I want to say that the, the collections are a unique opportunity to give really a sense to what we call dialogue of the world, dialogue between cultures. Because, for example, we have collections from all over the world, and what we want, presenting them, is not only telling our vision, our narrative about these collections, but including others. It's what we call multi-perspectivity. What do others think about this collection, especially representatives of the countries of origin, representatives of indigenous groups, scientists, artists, curators from the countries of origin? This is important. There's almost no, not any more uh, module of exhibi uh, exhibition left which we do not develop in cooperation with representatives of the countries of origin. And I think this is important. We have, for example, uh, objects from Tanzania. Tanzania was a German colony and what very few people know, many people know about the Herreros and what the, the German genocide, but very few people know that in Tanzania there was something quite similar. And um, what we want is we have some objects from this event, from this historical event, 
and I'm now in contact with uh, Tanzania and we can give them back because of course this is completely not uh, the way we want to things to come in into our collections or what we prefer we present them and through these objects we show together with historians from Tanzania we present this event this historical issue to the people I mean this is important and not only our view on this genocide but also including the view the people from Tanzania have or another example we are cooperating with an indigenous university from the Orinoco in Venezuela they are now since two years working with us they are developing uh, or we de together are developing a web-based web platform where later in the Humboldt Forum people who visit this part of the exhibition they can really get into contact with these people they can listen their their visions about our collections, what for them is important, how they are living today, and so on and so on. There are many examples. The last one is uh, the third floor, which will be fully dedicated to Asia. And we have one central hall where we want to present imperial uh, art from the court of the 18th century in China, from the imperial court. We have a wonderful throne, we have many other objects, and we will hand over this hall, a big hall, to Wang Shu, the Pritzker Award winner, he is one of the most reputed artists and architects in China, and he will design this hall. In this case, it's another, uh, let's say, format or another way of cooperation because to him, we just we hand him over this hall and the object and say, Look, this should be presented here. What do you think? And it was wonderful to see when he came to Berlin. We went through the, through the building, which still it's difficult to get a clear idea inside, you just have the dimensions. And he was so fascinated because, wow, this is exactly the dimensions of the central hall of a Chinese imperial hall. And immediately ideas came out of him, and he's now every two weeks sending designs and so on. And this is, I think, the way how cultures can really cooperate. They understand that they are also presenting themselves in Berlin and they want to help. We have many of us, because we have, of course, lacunas in our collections. And uh, they say, well, we can, we can offer you pieces for a few years as loans. One has, yeah, we have not to, to have this in our property. I mean, the modern way of cooperation between museums is not always acquiring, it's also exchange, especially if it's ancient uh, cultural heritage. And this is a way how we want to work together. And of course then, not only with the collections remain in the past, even many topics we can tell from the past, climate change and so on, collapse of civilizations, migrations, mm. sometimes, especially today, sometimes they, they, they seem quite, quite actual. And I think not only this, but also in the ground floor, we have to build a bridge to the problems, the challenges of, of nowadays and for the future. But nevertheless, the collections are the backbone. And I think there are a lot of opportunities and possibilities. And now the so-called Gründungsintendanz with Neil McGregor, was Bredekamp and me. And not only we threw alone, I mean, it's a large, a huge project, a challenging project, together with a large group of others, of colleagues, of Berlin institutions who can contribute a lot of their knowledge. We now have to develop this is what I just in very few words, very roughly explained to you. But I hope that I could make you understand that we have a completely new approach in presenting the collections. It will not be a, just a normal museum. It wants to be something more. And I think this is the unique opportunity we have because it has to be more than just a museum. Thank you very much. Good evening. It's a great honor to be the Mary Ellen von der Hayden Fellow in Fiction. Three years ago, while traveling through Chechnya to research my first and second books, I visited the Tolstoy Museum in Starogladovskaya. It was the only museum in Chechnya to remain open throughout the wars of the 1990s and early 2000s, largely because every day its curator sat at the front door ticket counter with a shotgun. Readers were welcome, rebels and soldiers were not. When I arrived, the curator's son met me at the front door. I wanted to see what artifacts or treasures could possibly be worth the enormous risk this family took in maintaining a museum in the midst of a war zone. He led me into the first room, which to my surprise 
was completely empty. He led me into the second room, which was also empty. The third room, too, was empty. What filled the empty galleries of the Tolstoy Museum were the stories the curator's son told about Tolstoy's life, his work, how his fiction provided sustenance to this particular family in a time of deprivation, how it became the moral compass by which they oriented themselves amid unimaginable disorder. This museum, built on a plot of land on which Tolstoy never actually stood, that had nothing that Tolstoy had ever actually touched, had become a kind of sanctuary for Tolstoy's stories. And by preserving them, the curator and his family had perhaps preserved some part of themselves from the surrounding destruction. I tell this story because it reflects my belief in the elemental power of literature and because it represents the focus of my career to this point. My first two books, a novel and a collection of interlinked short stories, are both set in Russia amid the wreckage of the Soviet Union and the ensuing conflict in Chechnya. You may be wondering what a writer who has never written a word about America is doing here at the American Academy. It's a good question. It's a question my mother asked me last weekend. <laughs> and it's one that I'm going to be addressing here as I work on a new novel set closer to home and further in the past, in Los Angeles and the Sicilian island of Lipari. It's a novel about the rise of Hollywood in America and the rise of fascism in Italy, about monster movies and the mafia, about writers and refugees, about the transatlantic cultural exchange between these two countries, even as they mobilize for conflict. I'm grateful for the rare privilege of writing it here amid these distinguished scholars and artists as part of this transatlantic exchange. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Christina Schwenkel, and I am a cultural anthropologist of Vietnam from the University of California at Riverside. And I'm also the uh, Bosch Public Policy Fellow at the Academy this semester. I'm very excited to be here back in Berlin in this beautiful setting and would like to thank everyone involved with the Academy for the warm welcome that we received and for the extraordinary opportunity to spend the fall here with a remarkable group of distinguished colleagues. Forty years ago, the war ended in Vietnam, and most people in the United States simply forgot about the fields of destruction left behind. It was easy to do so. Nothing gets you off the front page of the press more quickly than an end to the conflict. In the age of mechanical reproduction, media plays a critical role in shaping and sustaining memory. When Vietnam, the war, was no longer news, most people forgot about Vietnam, the country a land of technological devastation. In 1995, the US normalized relations with Vietnam, and soon after, I traveled to Ho Chi Minh City and then Hanoi as a graduate student to study urban reconstruction and the transnational politics of post-war memory. I've been working there ever since. People often ask me how I became interested in Vietnam. It's not a simple question for me to answer. Our intellectual pathways that lead us to these points in our lives are often complex. But I can sum it up in one word that I think this audience will appreciate but might not expect, Berlin. In 1992, I came here as an undergraduate to study the impact of unification on everyday life in the former East. Like my work in Vietnam today, I was interested in the transition from socialism to post-socialism and cultural struggles over historical memory. I watched with abject fascination as street names changed, Monuments were taken down, buildings demolished. Urban history was being radically altered before my eyes. So it's no coincidence that I ended up studying similar struggles over ownership of the past in a very different context. And yet there are surprising intersections that I could not have imagined at the time. During my first trip to Vietnam, I had two major observations that profoundly shaped the future of my work. The first was the extent to which the war differed when seen through the eyes of the Vietnamese and how representations of the past were changing quickly with reconciliation. One simple example, when you're in Vietnam, it's called the American War. And it was fought not for communism, but against imperialism, against US imperialists, actually. But today, they're called friends. 
Museums began to change their captions after returning U.S. veterans, and also a few investors, started to complain. My second observation was the extensive influence of East Germany on Vietnamese society. I was completely taken aback by the number of people who spoke German and asked me, Sind Sie Deutsche? How many people like to eat Suk or German Wurst? By the presence of Simpson S51 motorbikes on the road. And of course, I was not at all expecting to visit the heaviest bomb city and find that it had been rebuilt by East Germany. And then to learn that this unique landscape of architecture was under threat of demolition, owing to a coalition of development organizations headed by Germany. So while my first observation went on to become my first book, the second is my project here at the Academy. I am interested in urban planning as a traveling technology during the Cold War that was used to build new socialist cities in third world countries like Vietnam. As an anthropologist, I not only focus on the materiality of the landscape, new urban structures and infrastructure to create model socialist citizens, but also on cultural practices of dwelling, that is, how people inhabit, appropriate, and make sense of what at the time was an unfamiliar architectural form, the GDR housing block. Today, 40 years later, the blocks are still standing, though their dilapidated state is considered to be an eyesore by many. Interestingly, the threat of demolition has produced a wave of housing activism and a growing movement to preserve the buildings as part of the city's socialist heritage and friendship with East Germany. Little did I know during that first trip to Ho Chi Minh City that I would eventually again be embroiled in the politics of German memory, but this time they would be playing out on the former battlefields of Vietnam. Thank you. I'm extremely grateful to be here this year, this fall, as the Daimler Fellow. I'm a philosopher, and philosophy is perhaps an abstract subject and not the best subject to talk about late in the evening. So I thought I would introduce my project to you by telling you how I got where I am today and how I intend to take advantage of this marvelous opportunity at the American Academy. So as you may have detected already, I didn't grow up in the United States, but in the United Kingdom. And that meant that at the age of 15, I had to face a very difficult choice. On the one hand, I wanted to do literature, English, French, and German. On the other, I was very interested in mathematics and physics. Well, mathematics and physics won, and I went off to university to study that. But along the way, I became somehow discontented, disillusioned. And so I entered philosophy by the side door, through thinking about issues in the history and philosophy of science. And for the early part of my career, 40 years ago now, uh, I spent my time thinking about the status of mathematics, issues about physical theory and the physical sciences. And then one day, an act of serendipity, a student whom I was teaching came to me and said, look, you're always giving us these examples from physics. Couldn't you teach us something about biology? Well, I didn't know any biology, so that was a bit difficult. But as I started to investigate, I found it absolutely fascinating. And so I spent the next two decades working on philosophical issues connected with the biological sciences. And then another stroke of serendipity, a piece of luck. I was invited by the Library of Congress to advise Congress, in a very small way, I may say, uh, on the implications of the Human Genome Project. And that opened my eyes to something completely different. Not as science is cut off from society, but as science is part of society, intimately involved with the political and ethical and legal issues of the age. And that started me thinking about general questions about democracy and about ethics. And then I moved to Colombia. And at Columbia, I had the great good fortune to meet a very famous philosophical raconteur who became a dear friend. And one day I was talking to Sidney Morgan Besser, and he said, you know, you sound just like Dewey. You ever read Dewey? And I had to admit, no, I hadn't ever read Dewey. I'd tried, but I'd failed. So Sidney told me what to read, and I discovered America's great philosophy, 
classical American pragmatism. And that has brought me to where I am today. Because what I want to work on here is a small part, but the core of a book that will try to revive Deweyan pragmatism and pragmatic ideas for the 21st century. At the heart of that is the concept of progress, and that is going to be my chief topic while I'm here. Can we make sense of progress? In what domains does it make sense? Can we find better methods for steering ourselves in progressive directions in all sorts of enterprises? I think these are open and important questions. They involve such things as the character of democracy and the ways human beings relate to one another, and they go right back to the founding of philosophy in ancient Greece and Socrates' great question, how should we live? I'm immensely grateful to the American Academy for this opportunity, and it also gives me the chance to take back something I said earlier. I said philosophy is a very abstract subject. Dewey didn't think that. He thought that philosophy ought to be connected with other areas of inquiry and with life itself. So do I. Thank you very much. Good evening, uh, good Abend. I'm Monica Green, and I'm uh, very proud to be the Anna Marie Kellen Fellow of the semester. Uh, this is my first time in Berlin since the summer of 1989. And I'm thinking that a lot of things have changed, and I'm very much looking forward to um, getting to know the city all over again. What I want to talk to you about is um, uh, the project that I'll be working on, which is tentatively called Global History of Health. And what I want to do, uh, we, we were given three minutes um, to speak, so I'm going to give you three numbers. The number eight, the number 13.9 million, and the number um, one. The number eight. The number eight is the number of infectious diseases whose histories I'll be covering in the book that I'll be writing. Um, uh, I do them in chronological order by the, the, the ways in which, the circumstance in which they have come into human bodies over the course of, of many years. Uh, I start with leprosy, um, then malaria, then smallpox, uh, tuberculosis, plague, um, uh, syphilis, cholera, and HIV AIDS. 13.9 million. 13.9 million is the estimated point at which the two different species of the leprosy bacillus diverged. So going back 13 million um, nine years, that's how old the two species of leprosy are. We didn't know that there were two species of leprosy until there, um, just a few years ago. Uh, the one that we thought we knew was um, discovered in 1873 by a Norwegian uh, investigator, uh, Armar Hansen, uh, and that is why we now call leprosy Hansen's disease. The other species of leprosy um, is called Mycobacterium lepromatosis. That was discovered in 2008 and was discovered through genetics analysis. And genetics is um, the, 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 the unifying, one of the unifying themes that pulls my project together. And together they can trace back um, the history because of the divergences in the two organisms to this point of 13.9 of million years ago. Well, here's the thing. There were no humans 13.9 million years ago. We had not even diverged from chimpanzees at this point. So starting to think about that as a human disease globally distributed in populations throughout the world, that's how far back we have to begin our thinking of how did these two organisms develop into um, hosts that became eventually human beings, and why did one form of leprosy, M. leprae, turn into a global disease, whereas M. lepromatosis is currently known only in Central America? Those are some of the big questions I'm trying to wrestle with and to trying to create a narrative to explain them. The number one, my third number, one chimpanzee, one human. That was the beginning of the HIV AIDS pandemic in which we are currently living now. 
Approximately 80 million people throughout the world have been affected by HIV AIDS. But it started because one organism, not even an organism, a virus, passed from a chimpanzee into humans. How does that happen? How do pandemics begin? What are the circumstances that allow a, a disease in one individual person to pass to millions? Well, genetics has, has helped us explain that story by moving the, the story of HIV AIDS before 1981. We have watched the whole process all over again in the past um, just over 18 months with the Ebola. We have watched the beginning of a new human disease that has been passed from human to human to human. Those are the stories I want to tell. I want to bring all of those diseases together um, in one global history of health. Thank you very much. I'm Moish Postone. I teach social theory and intellectual history at the University of Chicago. It's a great privilege to be able to speak to you at the American Academy at Berlin as the Ellen Maria Garrison Fellow, Garrison Fellow, named for one of Hans Arnhold's daughters, honoring the family that has done so much to make this remarkable institution possible. My project is one indication of the expansiveness of the Academy's critical intellectual and cultural vision, for I am undertaking a fundamental rethinking of Marx's mature works, attempting to recast its significance as a foundational work of social theory with contemporary relevance. This project may appear counterintuitive to some, but it attempts to respond to the far-reaching transformations of the world in recent decades, which implicitly suggest that any adequate contemporary social theory must be centrally concerned with questions of historical dynamics and global structural change. The project seeks to show that a renewed encounter with Marx's critical analysis of capitalist modernity could significantly illuminate the nature of those dynamics. Nevertheless, it argues that it would be a mistake to attempt to return to Marx as he generally was understood during much of the 20th century. Rather, the failures of traditional Marxism and the increasingly apparent inadequacies of many post-Marxist approaches, such as post-structuralism and deconstruction, are rooted in historical developments that suggest the need to rethink as well as reappropriate Marx. The project will attempt to show that contrary to traditional interpretations, Marx's critical theory is not, on its most fundamental level, a critique of a mode of class exploitation undertaken from a standpoint that affirms labor. On the contrary, at its center is a critique of the nature and role of labor in capitalist modernity, one that is interwoven with the critical theory of temporality of the historical constitution of forms of time, both static and dynamic, as forms of domination. Methodologically, I will also be arguing that this theory is reflexive, by which I mean that it claims that if humans are socially and culturally formed, a social and cultural theory cannot pretend to be an exception outside of its own context, but must be able to account for itself as a historical possibility. On the basis of this approach, I seek to lay the foundation for a theory that in attempting to grasp the massive historical changes of recent decades, 
does so in a way that could illuminate what I regard as the fundamental double crisis of the contemporary world, the environmental crisis and the crisis of laboring society, and thereby contribute to a more adequate understanding of our social universe. Thank you. Good evening. Sounds touch me, and mood is the window of allowance, wide or narrow, to let sound in. My moods are equivalent to what I let myself touch and be touched by in turn, but also what I have no choice in the matter of being encased in. If moods are rooms, Feelings are the objects in those rooms. Art, their rearrangement. My name is Mary Capello, and as the extremely grateful Holtz Holtzbrink Fellow, I'm planning over the next two months to bring to completion a book on the ineffable subject of mood and its affinities with clouds, sonic atmospheres, and dioramas. Sonorous envelopes. That's French psychoanalyst Didier Andieu's phrase for the protective and precarious, requisite and porous, holding environment, literally a skin, that is lent us not by touch alone, but by the voice of our earliest caretakers. I love the idea of our sense of embodiment being established by the sound of another person's voice. And I can't imagine a telling of mood that doesn't try to account for sound and the way that sound environs us. I was trained as both a poet and as a literary and cultural theorist at SUNY Buffalo's Center for the Psychoanalytic Study of the Arts in an era that presented me with a vexing paradox. The questions posed by literary scholars were undergoing a sea change, but our modes of address, our scholarly forms, remain static and stayed as though cut off from the very epistemic shifts we were insistent upon. So ever since then, I've opted for a writing whose aim has been to bring a poetic sensibility into concert with a scholarly ethos. I've written books that include a nemic collage. It was called a memoir, based, but I call it a nemic collage, based on a twinned legacy of violence and creativity in my Italian-American family. I've written an anti-chronicle meant to thwart the ritualized routine of breast cancer treatment in the United States, a detour on awkwardness, ontological, diplomatic, aesthetic, and social, discursive double portraits on the forms that friendship took between gay men and lesbians in the age of AIDS, and a lyric biography of a medical pioneer and his cabinet of swallowed and aspirated things. Now it is mood that calls to me, mood, in German, the more richly untranslatable attunement that is Stimmung. Philosophers, psychologists, esthetes seem to agree that mood is the primary conditioning possibility for pretty much everything we do feel and perceive. Political theorists tell us that social change cannot happen without an attendant shift in mood. At the same time, no one really seems to know exactly what mood is. To be sure, our language for moody states of mind has become less precise at the same time that we speak more certainly of moods as something pharmaceuticals can treat. Mood awaits its own unanticipated literary form. And in this setting, congenial to the sharing of ideas, the Academy, Berlin, Mood rooms are occasions I'm hopeful to create with other visual, sound, and literary artists, scholars, museologists, and acousticians. I hope you'll join me next week when I inaugurate this term's public series with a multimodal presentation of mood and atmospheric reading. I won't ask you to lie on the floor <laughs> or put your ear to the table just yet, but only attempt the production of an atmosphere beautiful and strange, in which we might together re-experience mood as a language and as a skin, as gravity and as vibe. Please join me then.
Good evening. My name is Michael Miller. I'm a professor of history at the University of Miami, and I hold the Nina Gorison Chair Fellowship this year at the Academy. I'm very honored to do so. All my life, you may recognize this, some of you, are the opening words of Charles de Gaulle's memoirs. So it may be somewhat presumptuous for a French historian, which I am, to begin with the exact same words, but I'm going to do so nonetheless. Because all my life, or at least all my reading life, I have been fascinated by the human experience over time, which is what we call history. Uh, I have concentrated my own career on the history of France and the history of Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. If there is a particular pattern which marks that career, it's that I never do the same book twice. So I began with a history of the greatest of the French Parisian uh, department stores at the turn of the century. I then moved on to a study of intrigue and espionage, and even moved in the interwar years. I then went on to do a very European, actually very global, study of the maritime world across the entire 19th century, assuming across the entire 20th century. And now I'm back into France in the 19th century, looking at France and its waterways, by which I mean primarily its rivers, but also its streams, canals, and its brooks. If I followed this pattern, it's because I have a horror of repeating myself, but there's actually something deeper. And that deeper thing is that I regard all of my research projects as learning processes. I like to find some sort of question or subject which captures my historical attention, and then let my imagination engage with the different kinds of sources I can find, and go down all those potential byways which I think might be potentially rewarding. And in doing so, then see what kinds of new combinations I can form together, and even perhaps how I can move beyond received wisdoms. Uh, and that is really the kick when you begin to move from the learning process into the creative process. Uh, this pattern has actually characterized what I'm doing right now. Uh, I'm looking at France and its waterways, and I'm beginning with the perspective that France it's a country which in multiple ways has been very closely associated in its history with its rivers. Um, this, for instance, in the way in which it has been administratively ordered, in the way in which geography has been conceived, has to do with the fact that so many people live along river valleys, that so many of the cities in France are river cities. The way in which landscape has been constructed and presented has often been through its rivers and its canals. So I begin with that perspective and I then ask, where, where can that take me? And where it's been taking me so far is, for instance, looking at all the history which occurred along these rivers and waterways, but also how that history was written and how it was used. I'm looking at the ways in which property disputes, which pervaded these, these areas uh, over property rights, were also embedded in historical thinking. I'm looking at how the adjudication of those property rights disputes. Uh, basically tells us something about the governance of France, particularly over the first two thirds of the 19th century when this was not a democratic country. If so many cities are river cities, then I'm asking, what does it mean for a French city to be a river city? Un survivor, un survivor. Uh, this is still a work in progress, uh, but a couple of conclusions which I am leaning towards tentatively are one, that as the French engaged with their past, they did so with a very aged past of deep continuities, as much as with ruptures such as 1789. And that secondly, uh, just as rivers and other waterways were always constantly changing, but nonetheless were filled with these continuities, so too should we perhaps think of France in the 19th and 20th centuries as a country not where modernity and tradition were in tension with each other, but where they could coexist and comfortably coexist side by side. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Adria Julia. I'm very honored to be the Guna S. Mannheim a fellow for the visual arts and also I'm very thankful to be here in the American Academy and all the welcoming from all the staff and members here. Um, someone 
who has been already in Berlin before. It's not my first time. Some of you might know. I live here in the late 90s. I went to the Hochschule der Kunste. Um, it was a terrific time, a very different time in Berlin, as you might imagine. But being back in Berlin, it's, it's very significant to me, but also to my work and, and the way I make my work and the ways in which I think about my artistic practice and how I inform it. It is this question of return, this question of uh, to what do we go back, to how do we look to the past, and in which we can look into the future. To revisit, to see what have changed, to see what's left behind, and to compare it with new and old memories. So I'm questioning also the tools and the technologies that we use uh, to capture and to reproduce time and memories, from images to text to sound to, to even smell. And I'm mostly interested in what we cannot capture, what we cannot retain because it's ephemeral, because it disappears somehow. So it's this gap between the two, between the event and between its mirror that I'm very fascinated and interested in. So I consider art an act of resistance, uh, resistance to norms, to conventions, and to established uh, structures. So I work with film and with photography, with sculpture, with different mediums, and I build installations that I hope the viewers can engage and create their own meanings and objects and relations. So I hope you have, you have soon the opportunity to see some of an experience of my work. Thanks. I've always wanted to say I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> um, which I would. Uh, and the uh, trustees, Gerhardt, the selection committee, and the incredible staff uh, here for the honor and opportunity of the Siemens Fellowship to work in this wonderful place with these extraordinary people who I'm just starting to get to know. My name is Robin Einhorn, and I teach US history at the University of California at Berkeley. I'm a historian of American politics, and I focus on taxes. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not an accountant, which means that I can't do your taxes. <laughs> and this year, I won't even be able to do my own. But my work has been about discovering the kinds of things that taxation can tell us about politics more generally. And one thing I've discovered is how little we actually know about the taxes of the past, even in a country like the United States, where taxes and tax debates occupy such a privileged place in the national political imagination. But don't worry, I'm not going to say any more about taxes. Because I've also found that close attention to taxes can reveal a lot more. In my last book, figuring out the details of how particular taxes worked and what debates about them meant revealed a pretty profound truth about the uh, era of the American Revolution in general. And that was the comprehensive role of slavery in shaping American politics and American political institutions. Put another way, it revealed a profound and very well-known lie. A noble lie in the circumstances, but a lie all the same. And it goes like this. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now, Abraham Lincoln's goal in the Gettysburg Address was to make that true in the future. It was in no sense true of, uh, of what those fathers had done fourscore and seven years before the Gettysburg Address. They built a slaveholder's republic, which Lincoln's generation had to overthrow in a very bloody war to create, as Lincoln put it, a new birth of freedom. 
In other words, Lincoln told a lie about the past in order to secure a better future, or to quote yet again from the Gettysburg Address, to hear resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. Now, when I first reported these findings um, about the Slaveholders Republic almost 10 years ago now, I faced a lot of resistance from people with much less reason than Lincoln to insist on a sunny American past. And this resistance is still quite powerful, even among important scholars. Some of you may have seen the op-ed in yesterday's New York Times, which is resisting. So what does any of this have to do with taxes? That's how I learned the truth, by looking at the taxes. Taxation is an, inst uh, an institution at the heart of government and at the heart of politics, always. And that's why it can reveal big things you can't see if you focus, say, on political rhetoric. My current project has been to apply this method to look at the details of taxes and the details of tax debates to more recent American history. That's what I'm doing here, uh, uh, including to get the 20th century uh, story. I look forward to describing some of the findings from this research uh, on October 15th. Good evening, uh, my name is Vladimir Kulich and I am an architecture historian and associate professor at Florida Atlantic University. I am the Axel Springer Fellow uh, for the fall here uh, at the Academy and I will be working on my book about architecture in Yugoslavia in the global Cold War. I want to thank the Academy for the insight and the open-mindedness uh, for awarding us uh, for such a wide range of projects. I'm going to echo Tony's words or Tony's question, what am I doing here with this project that has not, nothing to do either with the United States or with uh, uh, Germany. Uh, but being in Berlin actually really has great symbolic uh, resonance for me. Uh, and I'll try to use my three minutes to explain why it's so meaningful for me to be here. Uh, as we all know, uh, Berlin is the place where the Cold War divisions materially coalesced in an architectural form in the famous or infamous Berlin Wall. In contrast to the divided Germany, Yugoslavia positioned itself as a site of encounter. Soon after its expulsion from the Soviet bloc in 1948, it emerged as a place where divisions would be transcended, not only between the communist East and capitalist West, but also between the developed North and the developing South. There is thus a curious inverse logic that tied Germany and Yugoslavia during the Cold War. Uh, and in my project, I'm in, interested in investigating that uh, logic uh, through the lens of architecture and space. For example, here in Berlin, uh, the Cold War materialized in the 1950s as a stylistic rivalry. We all know how the international style of the Hansa Viertel served as the visual signifier of liberal democracy, in contrast to the Stalin Allee, which stood for Soviet-style socialism. In Yugoslavia, such identifications were flipped on their head. Already in the mid-1950s, international modernism became the de facto official style of Yugoslav socialism, and nothing resembling the Stalin Allee was ever uh, built there. Or another example. Uh, by the 1960s, the Yugoslav coast of the Adriatic emerged as a major destination of international tourism, resulting in the construction of a vast new hot hotel infrastructure. And perhaps some of you may have actually used that infrastructure at some point. Uh, it was on that coast that the Europeans from either side of the Iron Curtain could meet each other. And also a rare site where uh, the Germans for bo both the Bundesrepublik and the GDR could vacation side by side. It is these stories and the related ones uh, of architecture glo architecture's global engagement that I hope to bring together in my project here at the Academy. They may tell us something new about Yugoslavia, but more importantly, uh, they also reveal how complex the topologies of the Cold War were, complicating the often black and white image that we still have of that period at, as, it, as it recedes uh, uh, further into the past. Again, many thanks to the Academy for this opportunity, and thank you. Uh, 
uh, Jason Pine could not be here this evening and asked that I read his, his statement for him. Jason Pine is honored to have been chosen as one of the two Bosch Fellows in Public Policy at the American Academy in Berlin. This award gives him the luxury of working with great concentration on a project he cares deeply about. His work, broadly speaking, is focused on marginalized people who find alternative ways of making a living and what these alternative ways tell us about more mainstream everyday life. His first book, The Art of Making Do in Naples, is about an immensely popular DIY music genre whose underemployed protagonists invest large sums of money to make it out of poverty. After many months of following singers from gig to gig, from studio to TV station, he realized that this scene is entrenched in the organized crime networks called the Camorra. His project then became an examination of the margins where the informal practices of making do bleed into the overtly illicit, illicit practices of organized crime. The question that drove, that drove his research was, why would people take on the risk of entangling themselves with organized crime clans in order to achieve success as singers? The answer he arrived at was that they were motivated, motivated by a desire for personal sovereignty. A similar question drives his current research. Why do people risk imprisonment, injury, and death in order to manufacture methamphetamine in their own homes? The answer is also similar. People make and use meth as a performance enhancer to work longer hours and make ends meet, and to feel productive. But this, kind, but this unique kind of self-possession they pursue is what makes this story startling. It's achieved through literal self-production. It entails tinkering with the, comp the compositions of everyday consumer products and the biochemistry of the body to harness occulted potencies. You may notice some, con uh, some continuity in these projects. They both have meant great, uh, great risks for Jason. Not only the risk of bodily harm, but more importantly, the risk that comes from putting himself in situations that test his wits and force him to question his own way of life. These research experiences compel him to find ways to communicate to audiences beyond a small circle of academics. To this end, he uses literary techniques to make his work more accessible and engaging to broad audiences, including the, the very people that he studies. Moreover, Jason doesn't work only with text. He uses uh, photo and video and gives performance lectures. He also creates artwork. The reason he couldn't be here this evening is because he's at an exhibition opening at the Chemistry and Alchemy Museum of the Chemical Heritage Foundation in Philadelphia, where he is unveiling a living meth lab installation. <laughs> the American Academy in Berlin, where he can, int uh, where he can intently focus on his work, and in <laughs> <laughs> and interact uh, with fellow scholars, writers, and artists, <laughs> is the perfect setting for pursuing his goal of creating far-reaching work. He is very grateful for this opportunity. Oh, Tony, you leave me really worried now. <laughs> what prospects for this coming semester? When I uh, served as president of Stanford, I had one big problem. There were about 1,400 faculty members from various disciplines. And each of them wanted to live, be within one yard of every other faculty member at the university so that they could get the multidisciplinary stimulation that supposedly comes from these interactions. And these fortunate people have exactly that opportunity. And uh, the American Academy provides it, and I'm very grateful for, to all of, all of you who support us. And we will have a fascinating time. The Stimmung will be excellent. <laughs> Thank you.